So here's a real example of a, of a dying business. So this is my Thailand restaurant, my Thai restaurant, well, my family. So my mum and dad set up the first Thai restaurant in East, of, East, East Anglia and about 35, 36 years ago. And I, I know I'm biased, but it is the best bloody Thai food on the planet. Um, and I don't even like Asian food. I'm like a fake Asian. I, I, I can't have spice. I can't, I don't even speak Thai. Um, <laughs> But anyway, he was blinded by early success. So for the first 20, 25 years, like profits went like this and everyone loved the Thailand restaurant in Norwich, uh, Nine Ring Road. And, um, <laughs> and, and the thing is, and we've, we've had some amazing A-list uh, celebrity clients and it, it's been great. However, over the last 10 years, um, I have started getting my head in, in the books and I was like, dad, you're ruining this, ruining this business. And he was like, no, 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 I've been in business 20, like 35 years, you've been alive, 32, I know a bit more. I was like, bullshit, Dad, you've been in business one year and then repeated it 35 more times. Um, and the thing is, the reason his business is declining is for two reasons. All of his clientele are loyal baby boomer friends. They're all now dying and all don't go out. So he's, he's literally naturally losing his, his client base and he refuses to do any marketing. He's like an old school self-employed, you know, I've got to do it myself because everyone else is useless. So he, he cleans the car park every day, he does the, the, sh the, the, the shopping, the flowers, like everything. Uh, and he never does any marketing and he's completely oblivious, no matter how much I try and pound it into him, that there's a city full of millennials on his doorstep that don't even know where he is. It's sad. So, and I'm, I'm going to have to buy him out of bankruptcy because he refuses to let me take it over. So. Um, I've got a little a nest, fun, nest egg fund for my dad just to buy him out at some point. Um, it'll be a bargain for me. But. <laughs> <laughs> so, so <laughs> I'm a nice guy, honestly. Um, so there, there's mass uncertainty ahead. And I, I'm just trying to be real here. I'm not trying to scare you. I just want you to be aware. So when stuff, when the shit hits the fan, you're not surprised. Um, when you're surprised on the markets, it means you're uh, behind the curve. So we have the sovereign debt bubble. Basically, every, every country on the planet um, is massively in debt. Uh, there, no, there are three countries on the planet which have zero debt. And coincidentally, it's every country that doesn't have a central bank that is not in debt. Um, there's a funny reason why we went into Libya. Libya was one of the most prosperous nations on the planet in terms of, uh, well, as it had no debt. We got rid of Gaddafi and the very first thing the Libyan rebels did was set up a central bank and a $200 billion loan to the Federal Reserve. Why would a bunch of farmers do that? Um, so they're now massively in debt. Um, and if you have a look at the US national debt, this is old, this is from 2010. It's now $21 trillion. So every, like Obama came in and he, you know, everyone said, oh, he's boomed the stock market, etc. But a lot of people don't know that Obama created more debt for the US economy than every president in US history combined. Before that, George Bush won that trophy, then Obama, and guess what? Trump is gonna do, he's gonna double, he's gonna exceed all the other previous presidents. But it's not their fault, it's compounding interest. When you're in debt, compounding interest gets you into more debt. When you're rich, compounding interest gets you richer. That's why the rich-poor divide will only accelerate, no matter what happens. Um, so yeah, this is, well, it's 21 trillion, so it's like up here now. Um, yeah, and it's the same with global currency supply and everything else. We have the corporate debt bubble. Um, this is a, a chance of margin debt. So margin debt is basically when a corporation borrows very cheap or free money from the markets and then they reinvest it into the stock market. Um, and basically, this, again, this is slightly old. It's 230% it's more than it was uh, before the pop. So we are taking on 230% more uh, risky head, um, leverage bets than we did before uh, the subprime mortgage collapse. So we are being riskier than we were. And, it, and global investor net wealth is actually um, far lower than it was up here. So we actually had uh, lots of surpluses in terms of wealth. I'm gonna, it's a big word, wealth, um, because of the roaring 2000s. We then lost it all here. So guess what? Everyone's being like the typical gambler during the, the death spiral where they're now gambling and doubling up and they don't have any wealth to back it up anymore. So we then have the private debt. So the UK, as a, as us individuals, we are the worst on the planet when it comes to private debt. 
we spend 150% more than we earn. Like, we, thought, we think the Americans are bad. No, UK citizens, we spend more than we earn. Um, and this, I mean, this is US households. Like, this is US households, what they earn, and this is what they spend. <laughs> it, it, it's nuts. We have a pension time, uh, sorry, pension time bomb or debt bomb. So you have to understand why the pen pensions came around. It was from 1909. It was a political tool. And basically in 1909, they said, right, everyone who's 70, 70, years, old or, or, um, 70 years old or older will get a pension. But mortality rates were much different back then. It was like giving a pension to a 123-year-old right now. They knew no one was going to get it. And since then, politicians went, oh, this is a vote winner. So they kept making it better and better and better. But the thing is, 93% of, of the UK state pension is an unfunded liability. Uh, that, I'm just going to let that sink, sink in. 93% of your pensions is completely unfunded. Why do you think they're having a massive drive to this new workplace pension scheme? It's because they're trying to use money from us now to pay those retiring today. It's a massive unfunded liability. Uh, we have a student loan time bomb. Uh, I, don't, I couldn't find the stats, but there's a, a vast percentage of students that never repay their student loan. Um, and yeah, the, the, I mean, the US uh, student uh, loan is uh, debt is now 1.52 trillion dollars, which is unreal. We then, <clears throat> yeah, and we also have the, the, the car loan time bomb. So lots of people are getting cars on finance back before the, the, the pop. Well, look at it right now. It's, it's much higher. Um, so again, we're just spending more than we earn and we, we want access rather than ownership. And people are resorting to PCPs and finance just because they want access to it, not knowing the real repercussions of it. Um, and then the energy junk bond. So um, who's familiar with the shale gas industry? Shale oil and gas. OK, it's one of the biggest cons over the last 15 years. So if you go back to the last US election cycle, everyone in America was going, oh, the US is going to be energy independent. We're going to produce more oil than, than the Saudis. We have five year, 500 years of, of, of oil. Well, in terms of quantity, yes, that, that is true. But when it comes to energy, especially oil, oh, hello. Um, it's all about um, quality, and there's a thing called energy, EROEI, Energy Return on Energy invest, Invested. And oh, in fact, talk about preparing for uncertainty. I always go everywhere with my big fat pens because it looks like the venue ordered like the smallest pens they could find. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, this is weird. Just quick chart. So sorry for those at the back. P please feel free to move to the front. There's plenty of chairs. The EROEI -E curve looks like this. So go back to the 1900s uh, or 1902 with the sweet go fields where, in Saudi. You, you could literally dig 30 feet down and hit sweet, light, crude oil. And the EROEI -E was about 90. So for every en joule of energy you put into the ground, you would extract 90 joules of energy back. Or for every barrel of oil you, oil you use to extract it, you've got 90 barrels of oil out there. Um, Oil right now, WTI, sweet crude, is around 12, 12.5. So the quality has dropped dramatically. Where do you think, what do you think the EROEI is for shale? We're lucky if we get 1.5. It's a massive con. And so what's happened is that um, if you take the Eagleford shale play um, in, in America and Canada, it's the world's biggest shale deposit like by many orders of magnitude. It costs roughly $2 billion a, uh, a year just to remain flat production. They have to drill a thousand um, wells per year for flat production. And guess what? Um, the shale industry, it's produced no profit and all the loans and, and the investments, they've all gone bust. Why? Because Saudi and OPEC went, oh, so you're your trump card is shale, okay, we're, we're going to hammer you because shale is unprofitable when sweet crude, when crude oil is below $90 a barrel. So what do they do? They drove it to $25 a barrel. They killed the whole shale industry in about six months. So yeah, you'll never see about this energy independence for, in the US ever again. Um, and as a result of that, we're, or Wall Street is, going, is, is suffering big time because of that. We have a stock market bubble. I could talk forever about this bubble. Um, I, I can't wait when this pops because like, as a trader, you make all your money when things go pop. Um, but this is where we are right now. This is the 2001 pop. 
2007 pop and it will be the 2018 to 2020 pop right here. I'm expecting it to come right back down to around this level here, by the way. Um, this is going to be a fun playground uh, for my friends and I. So, and then we have flawed monetary policy. Um, so when you look at the levers that control the monetary world, I, what the central banks do, they have two levers. You have, so if I'm a central bank, I can only do two things. I can either, uh, I can control the money, or the currency supply, or I can control interest rates, two levers. And so when you have to look at interest rates like a car, if you want to go faster, you put your foot down on the accelerator, so you go faster. When a corner comes around, you put your foot, take your foot off the accelerator um, and you slow down. So when you lower interest rates, you're trying to drive the economy faster. When you increase interest rates, you're trying to slow the economy down. Well, back in 2008, they had full use of these levers. So they're like, oh my God, everything's uh, going pop. Let's drop rates. So we're now in a, a world of zero to negative rates. That lever's screwed. Um, they can't use it anymore. It, in fact, they broke it off. They, like, it's stuck there. Um, so they got one thing left. I mean, they did massive quantitative easing, but it's pr they, they can't print too much because confidence underpins everything. So yeah, flawed monetary policy. Politicians don't have a clue about economics, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So all I want to show you here is that there are many little, well, they're not even little, there are many big things completely segre or some, they're somewhat uh, correlated, um, but everything's converging over the next five years. That, that's the only point I want to say. And by the way, it only takes one of these things to pop and it's like a domino effect. One pops, they all pop.